March the 12th, 1881, the Oval Cricket Ground in London, with the scene of a football match which changed the course of the beautiful game across the world. I speak to Jed O'Brien, the Scottish football historian, and England great John Barnes about Andrew Watson, captain of Scotland and the first black international player in history. Join me on the Alex Salmon Show, on air and online. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from Richmond in London and to the first of two special programmes marking Black History Month. The concept of Black History Month can trace its roots back to 1920s in America, where it was expanded and gained official recognition in the 1970s. It has been celebrated in the UK since 1987 in the month of October. This year it's been given additional impetus through the surge in support for the Black Lives Matter movement following the slaying of George Floyd in Minneapolis in May. The focus this year, as ever, has been on key historical figures such as Martin Luther King and Frederick Douglass or on discussions and examination on very current racial injustice. However, how about the forgotten heroes, black men and women whose achievements have been all but written out of history? Today for our first show marking Black History Month, we'll tell the story of one such man, a footballer and captain of his country. We well, consult the founder the of the Scottish Football Museum and one of England's greatest players, John Barnes. <laughs> Here in Richmond Cemetery seems an unlikely last resting place for the most successful captain of Scotland in football history. For this is the grave of the man who led his country to a six-month thrashing of the old enemy of England on their home ground, still the heaviest home defeat in the history of the Three Lions. We tell a largely forgotten story of a footballer who was as influential in the 19th century as Pelly was to the 20th. The year was 1881 and his name was Andrew Watson. Today we do our bit to rebalance history and to examine the remarkable tale of the world's first black international footballer. For this man should now take his rightful place in the Scottish football pantheon alongside Tommy Walker, Jim Baxter, Dennis Law, I'm Kenny Dalglish. But first, over to Alex in the studio with your tweets, messages and emails. Well, plenty of views in on uh, last week's show on the economy, which featured Professor David Blanchfour uh, and Alec Neil and Robin McAlpine speaking about new economic thinking in Scotland. Uh, and Donald Gillis says, three highly experienced, politically savvy people that know that following the same model that failed Scotland to date will not work for our future. Terry says, fantastic to see Common Wheels' Robin McAlpine on the show. A man brimming with innovative ideas and a real passion for a better Scotland. And Michael Kelly says, economies need to be placed on a war footing. During World War I, Asquith's government dithered. It was only when Keynes at the Treasury and Lloyd George at the Ministry of Munitions combined that they got the job done. Dana Smith says, competency by the new administration, she's talking about America, sets the tone. Better tests, contact tracing, wearing masks, bringing down the infection rate while we wait for a vaccine, stimulus, national renewable infrastructure jobs, fix inequality, patch up healthcare, hope beats chaos by a mile. And Bob Howie says we can get up and running if we impose the correct conditions and make sure we close loopholes so that we can get back to work safely. And Neil Robertson writes in and says, Alec Neil, of course, knows a lot about effective training and employment grants. When well, in the 1980s, he was a hugely successful and dynamic chief executive of the Cumnick and Doon Valley Enterprise Trust. He goes on to say, I remember, too, the adverts uh, for that trust to Robbie Coltrane, dressed up as Robespierre, telling employers to get their applications in before the cut-off date or there'd be a revolution and they'd be for the chop. Now, Callum Turkington says... Give our young people hope and a decent wage. Abolish zero-hour contracts in Scotland. And finally, Lynn Thompson says, Good to see Robin McAlpine. I've agreed and disagreed with Robin over the years, particularly his views on Brexit. Interesting to hear his views on the economy post-Covid. And now back to Tasmina. It's at the Kia Oval Cricket Ground, 
which was the scene of Andrew Watson's greatest footballing triumph. The Oval, best known now as one of the homes of English cricket. But back in the 1880s, Wembley Stadium was 40 years away from being built. And from 1870, this historic ground was the most common venue for England football internationals and indeed FA Cup finals. The early games against Scotland were then, as now, mostly England victories. But on the 12th of March 1881, something amazing happened. Scotland arrived with not just a new captain, but a new style of football, the passing game, and promptly thrashed the hosts 6-1. Founder of the Scottish Football Museum, Jed O'Brien, takes up the story with Alex. Jed, when you came across this figure of Andrew Watson, uh, was, was he somebody you knew much about before the, you were looking at the museum and the foundation stones of, uh, of Scottish football and world football? Well, to my shame, I knew absolutely nothing about him. And I was working on a feasibility study in 1990, which brought me to the Queen's Parks archives at the Old Hamden. I was looking through uh, a book of old photos of Queen's Park and Scotland teams from the 1880s. And there was this photo of the Scotland team in their blue and white hoops. And there was a black man stood at the back. Now, as what I thought I was a football historian, I knew that Arthur Wharton of Preston North End in the late 1880s was the first black footballer. So I actually refused to believe my own eyes that there was this black footballer. Now, there were three or four more pictures of him playing for Scotland against Wales, playing for Queen's Park, who at the time were the greatest football team in the world. But it took me nine years to prove that Andrew Watson was the world's first black international football captain before I could go to the press. Now let's get to grips with who this man was. So he's born in the 1850s in British Guiana, uh, his father was a sugar planter, not, not a slave owner, as is sometimes said, because slavery had been long since uh, abolished by then. He's brought to school. He was, uh, he was uh, his father uh, and uh, a local Guyanese woman uh, were his father and mother. And his father brought him to school in England. And then it seems to be the key point was he, he started studies at Glasgow University. Was this where Andrew Watson first found his football? Well... I, I'm fairly certain that will be true. They returned uh, to London at first and lived in very, very stylish surroundings in Chandos Street, where there are worth about 10 million, uh, the houses that uh, Watson lived in. But his father died in 1869, leaving him the equivalent of three or four million. And he returned to Glasgow where he spent a year studying under, amongst other people, Lord Kelvin. And this is when we first see him playing and he becomes match secretary for what was then a very well-known team, Park Grove. So he, as a young man, will have learnt the way of the Scotch professor, the intelligent, logical, scientific passing and running. And of course, he was a sporting genius and he took the Scotch professor game to its highest level. Now, let's turn to the scene of his greatest triumph. Uh, so in March 1881, Andrew Watson arrives with the Scotland team at the Oval, then the home of English football, captains the side uh, and leads the team to this extraordinary triumph of 6-1. Now, how did that come about? How could a Scotland team beat England 6-1 in the then home of English football? Because Scotland played a game that was entirely different to the English game. The English game, which was a game of the social elite in Southern England, was a dribbling game that came out of public schools. And its job was to show that you did not need anybody. You were individual and you were ready to run the empire. It's amazing that this was the attitude. Now, Scotland being a different country with a different culture, for at least 500 years had played a passing and running game 
every week in most of the churchyards and streets of Scottish towns. So the Scotland team, headed by Watson, had come down and were playing a game where they passed and moved the ball, which required thought, which required practice, which in England was tantamount to cheating. If you practiced, you were a cheat because the gentleman amateur turned up and deliberately showed that they weren't much bothered. But of course, 6-1 and the following year 5-1 was such a vicious blow to England, they had to learn how to try and copy this game that Watson was leading. So Watson's career uh, in international terms uh, was 6-1 against England at the Oval, the next year 5-1 for Scotland against England back, uh, back in Scotland, and also a match uh, against Wales, which I also think was a 5-1 victory. Uh, so, you know, that must make him, because he only got three caps. How can somebody who plays in the team, which wins three games, 6-1, 5-1 and 5-1, only get three international caps? What happened to him? Unfortunately, he moved to England in 1882 after the 5-1 game, and Anglo-Scots didn't get picked. So we've already established Watson was uh, the most successful uh, international captain of Scotland of all time again in the game against England. He was the, the world's first black uh, football administrator uh, in Queen's Park and Park Grove. Was he the first, world's first black professional footballer as he, as he pursued his career in England? Well, the evidence is starting to mount because uh, in the mid-1880s, he's playing for London Swifts, Pilgrims, Brentwood, London Caledonians. He then moves to Liverpool and turns out for Bootle in 1887. Now, an unknown anonymous person puts in an objection to the English FA that Watson is being paid because at that point they had accepted professionalism, but under strict rules like you had to live within six miles of the uh, team you played for. So they got away with it. And I have a thought that they got away with it because Watson was able to rely on his upper class pals in the English football establishment who would certainly not have wanted to embarrass Andrew Watson. But I am going to say he was the world's first black professional footballer. Now, Andrew Watson, how would you put him in the, the world pantheon of football? I mean, could you say that uh, in the 19th century he was as influential as, well, let's say, Pele in the 20th century? No disrespect to Pele. Pelé is a genius footballer, but that's where his influence ends. Andrew Watson played at a time when England, in 1882, had to admit that their game was wrong and they set out to copy Andrew Watson and the other Scotch professors. This game went through England and through Scots and English people who followed them went around the world. He is easily and by far the most important black sportsman of the 19th century and probably the greatest black footballer of all time. Join us after the break where we continue the story of Andrew Watson and look at how the influence of black players has helped transform attitudes towards racism among football fans. Join us then. Welcome back. At this famous ground in March 1881, Andrew Watson led his Scotland side to a remarkable football victory. Alex is in discussion with Jed O'Brien and then John Barnes of Liverpool and England. What happened to Andrew Watson after his footballing career? We've been to his, uh, his graveside in, uh, in Richmond, but what happened to Andrew Watson? Where did he go after football? Well, after football, he operated out of Liverpool as a marine engineer for 20 years. That that was his job. Uh, he eventually moved to Kew, probably a mile north of uh, where he is buried. And as happens, 
he was forgotten. If you can remember one great player per year for 50 years, you're doing well. So when he was buried, it went entirely unnoticed. And because by the 1920s, everybody just knew that England invented everything, he had been forgotten. Now, if we were to understand the truth of Andrew Watson, we would then have to accept that Andrew Watson was one of the inventors of the modern game. Now, seeing as he isn't English, that couldn't be allowed. But Jed, of course, thanks to the work of yourself and others, uh, Andrew Watson's now experiencing something of a revival, the, the mural that you mentioned in, in Glasgow. Tell us about uh, how the importance of Andrew Watson is now being revived and what hopes you have that his name will soon be on the the lips of every Scottish child, knowing what a, what a great football influence he was. I'm hoping that in the next five years, there isn't a child in Scotland who isn't proud of Andrew Watson. But the road is long and hard because he has to be placed into the curriculum. Hundreds of media reports need to be done on him and they need to be repeated year on year. We then need to move on and push forward the truth that Scotland invented the modern world game. Now, that's going to be a very, very difficult thing. It's going to take us, I would say, 20 years before people start accepting that there is an argument. But obviously, with my book and the work of what is becoming more and more people around the world, we will eventually succeed in placing Andrew Watson in the pantheon of world football. And lastly, how about young black kids in Scotland? How, how important might it be to them uh, to know that uh, the country was captained by this amazing player way back in the 1880s? Wouldn't that be an extraordinary thing to understand and to know about Scotland? Absolutely. Um, I always tell the children that, like them, I'm one of Jock Tamsin's bands. I've moved to Glasgow 30 years ago. I've been accepted. And I'm able to say, and look at Andrew Watson. For those of you that are black and have arrived in the last few years, here's a man of whom you can be proud. And he shows you that you can succeed here because you will be accepted. Jed O'Brien, thank you so much for telling us some of the remarkable story of Andrew Watson. Thank you. Now, exactly 100 years after Andrew Watson became the world's first ever black professional footballer signed for the Merseyside team of Bootle, a young man called John Barnes signed for Liverpool Football Club. John, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Uh, Andrew Watson, had you ever heard about this, uh, this figure, this extraordinary story of a, a black captain of Scotland, led his team to a 6-1 thrashing of England, but was lost from the, the annals of football history? Why do you think that is? I, obviously, once I knew I was coming on the show, I did some research on it. I did know about Scotland's 6-1 uh, thrashing of England, as all Englishmen do. Uh, but to know that there was a, a, a black man playing for Scotland at the time, of course not. Why it was lost in the annals of history was because, of course, a lot of people, you can go back to, to someone, for example, like Tony Collins, who was the first manager, black manager for Rochdale, um, who won the League Cup that no one knows about. We assume that black footballers started with Viv Anderson and black managers started with in the 80s or 90s, whenever the first black manager came along. So, of course, we don't know much about the, the historical aspect of, of so many black figures in history. And that is why it's very interesting to really delve into it. So 100 years after Bootle signed Watson, you became only the, the second black player to, to sign for Liverpool Football Club. How much overt racism did you encounter uh, in that period of the 80s and 90s? Well, of course, people remember me signing for Liverpool and the iconic picture of me backing in the banana off the pitch against Everton, when I don't even remember doing it, because, of course, back then, a banana on the field was a regular occurrence. So while it was a high-profile game, Liverpool versus Everton, the media make a big deal about it, that was in 1988. Um, from 1981, when I was playing football, that was a regular occurrence playing at, when I played for Watford. Racism wasn't unique at that time. It wasn't even um, discussed. It was a part of everyday life, not just in football, but in society, whereby people were racially abused and no one batted an eyelid. So, of course, football being high, media attentive and very high profile, people made a big deal about how terrible it was. But my thing, even back then, was about how racism in society is much worse. 
in terms of what the average black man goes through rather than me as a professional footballer earning the money I'm earning, living the life I'm living, who may get racist abuse on a football field. But um, silent racism and invisible banana skins were thrown at black people every day of their lives, just in the society they lived in, the, the, the environment they lived in when they went to jobs, their lack of opportunities. And that is what I'm much more interested in, in, in stamping out rather than complaining about a few racists in Bulgaria or, or some racist football fans. And that's really what I'm now interested in, 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 in doing. Andrew Watson in the 1880s was secretary of Queen's Park, then the greatest yeah. club in the world. He was the first black football administrator. So what does that tell us about the, the lack of progress in 150 years? It speaks volumes, as does Tony Collins, the first black manager in England who managed Rochdale, not a big club, for six years and won the League Cup. But he wasn't particularly successful at Rochdale, however, apart from the League Cup. However, he stayed in the job for seven years. So that tells you that although you're black and you are not necessarily being successful, but they, they judge you based on your ability, because in, in paradoxically, the le when there weren't that many black people, racism was less. The more black people that you have in any country, there is more racism because there's only a certain amount of elite people. And if you have more people who want a slice of the pie to get into these positions, that is then becomes a threat to the status quo. So while you have one or two black people, the racism doesn't have to be great because they're, 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 they don't pose a threat to the status quo because there's one or two of them. When there are hundreds of them, they pose a threat. So therefore, a narrative has to be then been spoken about, about the, the group's potential, the group's worth. There was no discussion about Andrew Watson's potential because it's there to be seen, or Tony Collins' perception because that doesn't pose a threat to the existing status quo that we don't want to upset. Paradoxically, there's much more racism in countries where there, there are more black people rather than less, and much more lack of opportunity for those people because of that situation. When I first heard of the story of Andrew Watson just, just a few months ago, uh, as somebody like most Scots immersed in football you know, as a child, I, I felt really angry that uh, I'd never heard of this guy. Uh, and I was cheated that, uh, you know, apart from the 6 1 thrashing of England, which I'd like to hear about, but she did that. I hadn't heard of this great Scottish player. It was just a victory, Alex. I mean, you know, you don't have to, 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 to lay it on that thick, the thrashing. And he said that with such vigour and such meaning. It was a 6 1. It was a 6 1 victory. Those four <laughs> disallowed goals for Scotland as well, incidentally. It could have been 10 1. <laughs> but I'm wondering, how do you think it would have acted as an as a inspiration, a role model for, for young black kids to know that? the Scottish captain in that triumph uh, was uh, Andrew Watson. Would that in itself be an inspiration for, for youngsters? Very possibly. And of course, Black History Month is about empowering black young, young black kids to understand that their history is varied and, and you have excellent black people in the past from an intellectual point of view, scientific point of view, who have done great things. But this is what we've been doing for a long while. We've been trying to to influence young black kids to see their heroes, not just as boxers or footballers, as seeing them as intellectuals, seeing them as a scientist. So that's what we do. More importantly, Black History Month shouldn't be for black people. It should be for white people, because white people have to understand the history of black excellence from an intellectual and moral point of view. We need white society to see us as equal, not for us to see ourselves as equal, because I know we're equal. So the inspiration that it can give is fine. But once again, what we also have to do is we have to say, yes, there was the most intelligent man in the world from a scientific or, or intellectual point of view was a black man. I mean, he wasn't, but if we say that, that's fine. How is that going to help young black kids now if they can't get a good education, if they're going to get stabbed by the time they're 14 because of the inner cities that they live in, whereby we have to solve that problem to give equality to underprivileged kids? And I'll use Scotland as an example, because when, as you will know, there was a huge knife crime problem in Glasgow many years ago, 15 years ago, whatever it was, and it was seen as an inner city problem whereby you had to tackle the inequalities in the inner cities for these young kids, that was fine. What is happening in London is not seen as an inner city problem, it's seen as a black problem. And of course, the more you have this narrative that it's black kids killing black kids, when it was in Scotland, it wasn't a white problem and you weren't seeing white unworthiness or white delinquents, it was inner city problem. Uh, John, you came as a, a lad from uh, Jamaica to England, uh, but uh, I read you could have played for Scotland if the Scottish Football Association had moved a bit quicker. Is that true? Would you have, uh, would you have considered playing for Scotland if they just got off their backsides and signed you up? I could have played for Scotland, Northern Ireland or Wales because my dad was a diplomat. He was a colonel in the army. He went to Sandhurst with Andrew Parker Bowles, Camilla's husband. He was his classmate. 
So I'm from a middle-class Jamaican family. My dad got a diplomatic posting for four years. So we didn't emigrate. We just came because he was a, he was a military attache. After four years, I'm going to go back to Jamaica. I went, got offered a scholarship to go to America and American University. And while I was playing in the park, Watford saw me playing and offered me a contract. So that's why I stayed. So I became a British citizen, not an English citizen. So I could have played for any of the four home, home nations. England was the first one to ask me when I was 18 years old. I could have played, yes. And I, in fact, when I first came to England in 1976, um, I remember England playing Scotland at Wembley. I think the Kenny score when they won one nil, and of course people were jumping on the goalposts and they invaded the. Um, I think I was supporting Scotland then. You know, I wasn't an England fan, and, and I liked the underdog, and you know, I liked the attitude of the Scots. So I was quite happy for Scotland to beat England then. So I would say yes, there would have there would have been a good chance had Scotland asked me, I would have played for Scotland. And finally, John Barnes, next time you you're watching uh, England play at the Oval, will you? You give a, a thought to, to Andrew Watson and that Scotland team of so long ago? I had a great time at the Oval when I came in 1976. I went to the Oval, but I saw the West Indies destroy England at cricket, which gave me a lot of joy. But of course, next time I'm at the Oval, it'll be difficult for me to, to even think about that, only because the Oval for me is a cricket ground. So imagining England playing Scotland at the Oval and Scotland winning 6-0. And of course, because I'm an Englishman now, I've been here for many years, um, I, I don't want to think about... Scotland ever beating England, which you can appreciate. <laughs> but you'll have a thought about Andrew Watson. Well, now I'll think about Andrew Watson, obviously. Um, and I would want Andrew Watson to have scored all six goals, but I want England to have scored seven. <laughs> John Barnes, Watford, Liverpool, England. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. It could have been Watford, England, Watford, Liverpool and Scotland. If only times were different. <laughs> Thanks very much. At this famous ground in March 1881, Andrew Watson led his Scotland team into football history. His career saw him play for the greatest club sides in the world, Queen's Park and Corinthians. But his extraordinary talent didn't trailblaze for other black players. It was to be almost a century before Celtic's Paul Wilson became the next black player capped for Scotland and 130 years before Ifeoma Dieke became the first black woman to captain Scotland. Scotland was not alone in being slow to see black players break through in the beautiful game. Before the Second World War, international football was basically an all-white sport. Since then, black players such as England's great John Barnes have transformed the game, not least in the Premier League. Gradually, country by country, this has helped change attitudes among the young as the battle against racism is carried forward generation by generation. Of great interest, is why the Andrew Watson story has been lost to history. That is, until the work of people like Jed O'Brien have now brought it back into the public gaze. If past generations of Scottish children had known that one of the most influential figures in the foundation of the greatest game on earth was black and Scotland's captain, how would that have impacted on the battle to break endemic racism? And what could it have done for the self-esteem of young black kids growing up in Scotland? Indeed, Perhaps the Oval 1881 could have become as totemic for Scotland fans as Wembley 1966 is for England fans. But it's not too late. If a celebration of black history is to mean anything at all, then it is figures such as Andrew Watson who need to be rescued from the hidden vaults of the past and restored to their proper place as people whose contribution changed history, changed it for the better and inspired us all for the future. And so from Alex, myself and all at the show, it's goodbye for now. Stay safe and we hope to see you all again next week.